Do you enjoy drinking a great tasting IPA and thought you wouldn't mind making it yourself? Then come along with us and we'll show you how to make the brew step by step from scratch. Let's go. Hey guys, Musa here from Quantum Home Improvements and Solutions. Welcome back to the channel. So today I've got with me William West, who's a journalist and author. Hi. And also I've got Dr. Penner, who uh, went through a very tough times with me when I went through my spinal injury with uh, Corda Aquinas Syndrome and uh, went every step of the way. And so it's an honor to have both these men with me. A pleasure to make beer with you today. <laughs> Before we start, I'd like to just mention about my dad and Ron's mother-in-law. Today's the anniversary of their birthdays. God rest their soul. So I'd like to dedicate this video to them. So for you who follow my videos, you know that I generally make Cooper's beers uh, with their homebrew kits, and I find them very easy and very affordable. But Ron actually inspired us to make this video, uh, knowing Bill West has been brewing for 30 years, and he makes a grain beer from scratch, and that's what we're gonna do today. So the brew we're making is an IPA, and uh, Bill's been making it for a while. The grains we're using is ale malt, and we're using uh, just straight out wheat. We're gonna be using light crystal malt, uh, and we're gonna use Munich. So sometimes the most important part of making a brew is actually the hops. So we're gonna be using two types of hops today. So we're gonna be using the American Cascade hops, uh, for the bitterness, but we're gonna use the Galaxy Hops for the fruity taste. So then Galaxy Hops is actually a success story in Australia. It was developed uh, back in the mid 90s and released around 2009. And it's a combination of both Pride of Ringwood and Pearl Hops. And the Pearl is actually a German hops. So all the ingredients that I've got today, I got from Country Brewer in Nepean, and Dee, the proprietor, helped me through it all, make sure that I've got the right quantities uh, to make Bill's Brew. Now I've tasted Bill's Brew and now I'm not a bitter person. I don't really like bitter beers, but because of the Galaxy, it's really fruity and I really enjoyed it. Okay, so now we'll get into it, but the first thing we need to do is put 15 litres on the stove and get that up to 72 degrees. And while we're waiting, we're gonna weigh out the grain according to Bill's recipe, and, uh, and that way we can start the process. Okay, so now the first grain we're gonna measure out is the ale malt, and we need 2.5 kilos. So I'll just get Bill to pour that in. Okay, so the next one we're gonna put in is the Munich and we need half a kilo of the Munich grain. Beautiful. You've done this before. I hope so. <laughs> so the next one is the wheat and we're gonna put 250 grams. So just one quarter of a kilo. It smells nice, doesn't it? Oh, beautiful. Good enough to eat. Okay, so the last one is the light crystal. Thank you, Ron. So this one is the one that makes it look darker, the beard is darker, is that right, Bill? That's right, yeah. Yeah. yeah it'll give it a good colour. So it's not going to make it... I like. That's yeah. right, but it's not going to make it very dark. Yeah. Dee actually referred to this as an amber ale, oh, okay. um, but it is more of a pale ale. Okay. How much of this? 250, is it? 250 grams. Okay. Okay, so we've done all the grain measuring. Uh, we are gonna duplicate this. Uh, this will make 15 liters of uh, brew. So we actually wanna double it up because we're gonna share it between the three of us. So while Bill's making that brew, I'll make the alternate brew and we'll get the two going and we'll put them in two separate fermenters as well. Okay, so the temperature is getting very close to 72 degree, so we're almost ready. Uh, so now this technique is called brewing a bag. So I've got this bag here from Country Brewers. So Bill, if you can explain the technique. Okay, well it's very simple. You're just putting the, the grain in the bag. Inside the pot. The, the bag goes inside the pot, that's yep. right, at, at 72 degrees, but that will drop. Once we, we put the cooler grain into that water, uh, the temperature will drop down to about 65 degrees and, uh, and then the enzymes in the, in the um, grain kick in and convert uh, the starches into sugar. Beautiful. All right, we'll take the lid off and we'll get the process going. Okay, so uh, Dee did suggest that we put a gauze underneath the bag so it's not touching the direct heat of the, of the element uh, or the gas. So we just slip that in. Get the grain right in. Okay, great. Yep. There's the Munich. And it doesn't matter about the order, just um, yeah, you, you do that one. Yep, so this is the yeah. light crystal. Crystal, that one. Uh, this one here is the wheat. Very good. Beautiful, yeah, look at that. Well done. Wow, that's really filled this up. Yes, pushing you can through. Smell it already. That gives a beautiful smell, oh, doesn't it? Yes. Wow. I feel thirsty already. <laughs> 
It smells so fresh, doesn't it? It does. It's just it beautiful. Does. Okay, so now we'll put the blanket on. Just keep that warm. Just all the way around. There we go. Back up in here. Okay, so we put the, the blanket around. Yep. And cover it over the top as well. Uh, wait for a few minutes and then we'll just lift the uh, blanket back again yep. to... To make sure the temperature's okay. It should be around 60. We'll see how it's going. Just have a quick look. So 64 and... Uh, I think 62 is okay. Yeah, um, Dee did say 62 was That's okay. Right. Yeah, but best to start as, as close to 65 as you can. Beautiful. It will come down around 63. 63. After an hour. Yeah. Okay, so the grain's been sitting now for one hour and the temperature is actually still holding around 65 degrees, which is surprising. So we've made the second batch independent and that's also sitting at around 65. It's fantastic. Now we're removing the grain. Um, while, while the grain was in there, it was called the mash. Once we take it out, we call it the wort. Uh, so now I'll just wash off all the excess sugar. If we can turn that around, yeah. that's turning beautifully actually. So this is another about two liters of hot water. Okay, so you ready? One, two, three. Ah. Okay, so now we'll just let it drain uh, and then we'll transfer the remainder back into the pot. So we've drained the, um, the grain enough now, we can remove that and we'll pour uh, the rest of the fluid. Yeah. Great. All right, so that's almost boiling now. It's what, 93 degrees? Yes. Okay, so we'll just tip the remainder in? Tip the remainder in. It's not too hot for you, Ron, is it? No. Wow, that's looking fantastic. That's beautiful. It smells great, eh? Oh, yeah. yes. Wow, that smells really nice. Okay, so we've measured out the hops. Uh, it is a little difficult using these kind of uh, scales. Uh, a digital one would be better. So we've actually visualised it as well, just to make sure that they're fairly accurate. Um, and so now we're ready to put the hops into the boil. So we are gonna use these socks. I did get this from uh, Country Brewer as well. Um, and we just basically just put them in the bag just to stop them from uh, having any floaties. So you just tie the top, is that right, Bill? Just and you just let them sit in inside, is that right? I just throw it in. Okay, so now we've got the pot now to a gentle rolling boil and just leave it like that for around 45 minutes and then we'll start the next process and put in the um, galaxy hops. And um, so, Bill, I just wanted to ask you, with the hops, why are we doing uh, two lots and also why one for one hour and why the other for 15 and five minutes? Well. The reason is that the hops um, do two things. Uh, yep. The longer boiled ones that boil for an hour are the bittering hops. Yep. So they give the, uh, the beer the bitter taste. Yep. The other one is for flavor and aroma. Okay. And you only boil it for a much shorter amount of time uh, between 15 and five minutes before flame out. Okay, so now we've emptied out this pot as well. So we're going to run in around about 20 minutes apart and that's working really well. So we've drained this and, uh, and we'll do the same for this one. So Ron, I just wanted to ask you, you, you've been making wine for pretty much most of your life yeah. uh, since you were a baby. So that's what, 30, <laughs> 30, 30 years now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah but I, can you tell us what kind yeah. of wine you're making? Well, I, I learned from my uh, father. So um, <laughs> essentially we just make it without any um, preservative in it. So, so you don't even put yeast in it? You no. use just the yeast of the skin yeah, of the, yeah, uh, the grape? Yeah, the yeast on the, on yep. the skin. Yep. Uh, so, you know, it, it's been something that we've always wanted to do because uh, it, it, the preservatives often give, makes us, uh, gives us headaches, and yep. side effects. And yep, my yep, yep. especially cannot drink bought wine. So okay. I, and my dad, and we loves making it and we do it as a family thing. And you do like a big batch every yeah, year, right? Eh? Exactly, yeah. We, we make sort of something like about 200, 300 litres a year. Wow. And then just gradually drink it over You must have a big family. <laughs> we give oh, some away too. Or, or you visit the hospital. <laughs> or my liver. <laughs> my liver loves it. <laughs> So this has inspired you to learn more about beer because oh, you like yeah. dark beers, uh, you like uh, bitter beers. I like things with a, a nice, uh, sort of a, a strong flavour. I yep. like strong flavours. And so the beers that uh, I, I most appreciate are dark ones with a bit of bitterness, which is why thank you very much for making these one, this one a little bit darker for me. And so, yeah, I, I thought this year I would make the wine, I'd make the beer instead. And Beautiful. And a better way to do it from scratch. Fantastic. Yeah. It's so great. So with the cost, I mean, you're saving a fair amount of money because boutique beers, and this is a category I would call a boutique beer, yes. uh, and boutique beers, uh, you know, they're, they're very expensive. So we worked out for uh, price-wise that this is like probably one quarter of the price. So Bill, um, I want to talk to you about your book, Riddles of the Shroud. I love this book. Um, for me, 
uh, when I found out about the shroud back in probably, uh, I would say 1995, yeah. um, you know, coming into my faith and understanding my faith more and finding out that this cloth was the original cloth laid over Jesus after he was crucified. And so it's been controversial. Everyone knows about the controversy, I'm sure. Uh, but people who don't know and don't understand it, this shroud uh, has the image of Jesus on it. And something that cannot be duplicated, even with today's technology, I believe. Yes, but Bill, can you tell us more about it? Well, the, the thing about the shroud, I mean, th this subtitle says it all, questions science can't answer. The thing is, it can't be replicated. Um, and the reason is that it's an impossible image. Um, scientists have studied this. It's the most studied artifact in history. Um, and the features of it under the microscope can't be replicated. Nobody's ever been able to do it. And even with today's technology. Even with today's technology. And that was a real surprise for me because as a journalist, I knew that it had been carbon dated in 1988 and that the carbon dating claimed or, or indicated that it was from the Middle Ages. But a lot more research has been done since then. I was absolutely knocked out by the amount of research that's been done. And that research shows beyond any doubt that this thing is the real thing. It is really... Bill, what got me, you discovered that the closer that the cloth was on our Lord, yes. the different the carbon dating was. Yes. So the right. radiation that would have come from him that caused this image um, was, was uh, as the further it went, went away from his body, the less the, 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 uh, the dating was. Is that right? Or, or right. increase the dating? Well, well basically, it's, a, it's an impossible image from the point of view that the original is actually a photographic negative. Yep. Um, but as you say, it's also 3D. And the reason it's 3D is that it recorded the distance between each part of the body and the cloth, and that creates a 3D image. So... Um, and, and the other thing that's quite remarkable about it is the fact that um, the image is made up of only the very surface layer of microfibers on the cloth. Um, there's no uh, uh, paint, pigment, ink or dye on it. Just those absolutely microscopic, they're one fifth the width of a human hair. Wow. Uh, and they've been discolored, discolored in a way that creates this negative photographic image it's, it's fascinating. I could talk all day about it. <laughs> I could. Yeah. That's right. Great. All right. We'll get back into it. Yes. Okay, so it's a nice soft rolling boil. We're now at 45 minutes, and it's now time to put the, both the Cascade and the Galaxy Hops in, and we'll put them in for 15 minutes. So we swapped the pots around because we couldn't get that pot hot enough. So this is the one we originally started with without confusing you. Um, so we've gone uh, to a smaller element because we only need a soft boil here. Okay, so now we're at the 55 minute mark, and for the last five minutes, we're gonna put in the hops. So it's been boiling for an hour. So now I'll get Ron to come and bring it over, and he can put it in this bowl of ice, and we'll get that temperature down really quick. Okay, so the temperature that we're aiming for is around about 30 degree, uh, and then we'll start the process of putting in the uh, fermenter. Okay, so while that's uh, cooling down, I'll just take the hops out. I'm also going to get the fermenter and I'm going to sanitize that with phosphoric acid. Now, I'm not showing the process of how to sanitize in this case here because this video will be a long one. So if you like, I'll put a link below of another video, a Cooper's uh, video, and how I show the full process of sanitizing. Okay, so this is the fermenter I'm going to use. It is a Cooper's fermenter. Uh, it's a two-part system. So I'm going to take the first part off because we're only going to have 15 litres, which will see it be about here somewhere. Um, so first, I will sanitise the tap. Just spray that. And also where the inlet. So Cooper's say don't use oil when you're putting these on. They can be a little tricky. Just put a bit of water and that'll help it go on. Okay, so we get the temperature down now to 30 degree and we're ready to start the process. So if you could just pour that in, please, Rod. That looks a beautiful colour. And it smells great. beautiful, eh? Yeah, yeah. There's so much great with it. No, I'm quite surprised. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to put in tap water to fill it up to 15 litre. Yep, just drop that in. So you've got to make sure that your quality of water is good. That's it. Okay, done. Well done. Very good. That looks brilliant. Okay, so the temperature now is sitting at 26 degree, which is the top range for this yeast. And this yeast is the Fermentus Safael SO4. Now Bill tells me you can also use SO5. So before we put the yeast, we're just going to take a hydrometer reading and just get the original gravity. Yeah, that's a nice looking brew. 
It's not too dark actually. No, it's good. Just nice color. It's a nice right. color. Yeah. Looks like a normal ale. It does. All right. Yeah. Okay. Look at that. That's sitting very close to 1040. Um, I'd say 1039. So we'll record that mm -hmm. and then we'll then compare it to the final gravity when this is finished. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, whatever you do, don't put this back into the fermenter. Yes. You can either try it or throw it out. Yeah. Yeah. It tastes like. Wow. It's bitter. Is it bitter? And it's, it's got a nice fruity taste it's to it. It's actually bitter. When you boil a brew through a grain, you do lose a lot of oxygen. So you've got to put the oxygen back in for the yeast to actually do its job. So the way we're going to do that is use this paddle and we're going to use this drill. Both of them need to be sanitized. I'll give them both a quick spray. And just be careful not to go uh, above the brew, uh, the fermenter, because you could get something falling off the drill and you keep the paddle up high. Okay, so Bill tells me that you aerate it for around about two to three minutes. It actually depends on what you're using. Uh, if you've got something slower, it's going to take longer. But you can see the colour here. There's a lot of oxygen in there now. Okay, so now I'll just pitch the yeast. Uh, so I'm just going to put it in the middle because there is a lot of froth. We've uh, frothed way too much, but hey, it's not going to be a big deal. Uh, so when you're putting it in, I'm just going to put it in the centre and I'm not going to mix it in. That way it doesn't travel to the sides, get stuck to the wall and not get used up. Yeah. Okay, so we'll do just put the lid on and we're done. And so now we'll just leave this for six to eight days. Uh, we'll probably bottle it on the seventh day, but we won't know until we get closer. And so you know when to bottle it when your brew has stabilised. So you'll need to do a reading two days in a row. And so as long as the reading are the same, you know it's ready to bottle it. So as I said before, this yeast ranges in temperature from 18 to 26. So if it's too cold, you'll need to put a heat pad under it. If it's too warm, you'll need to put it in a cooler spot. Okay, it's now the seventh day and the brew has now stabilised. We did take a hydrometer reading over the last couple of days and we know that it has definitely stabilised, but we will take one more. So the temperature did drop down to around 18 degree, uh, which is on the lower parameter of this yeast, um, what you should be brewing at. Uh, so we did use the Morgan heat pad just to bring it up and it sat around about the 23, 24 degree. If it got a bit warm, I turned the heat pad back off. So the midpoint is actually quite a good area to be. Okay, so now I'll just take another hydrometer reading Okay, that should be plenty. Okay, I'll just put that in. Just let that stabilise. And there we go. It's sitting at 1005, uh, which is the same as the other brew. We did actually already bottle that, and it came out at the same. So they're both the same. Now, the difference we did with the other brew, uh, Ron wanted to have a bit more bitter uh, taste. So we actually made the Galaxy, not the Cascade, but the Galaxy, the bittering hop. So we put that in for an hour. Uh, and then we put the Cascade in uh, more of a fruity taste. So uh, it will have a different taste. All right, so when you finish with the hydrometer, um, don't put this back in your brew. Uh, either taste it or, or throw that out as like last time. So Bill, I'm gonna get you to taste it. Tell me what you think. Fantastic. Oh, good, fantastic. <laughs> Okay, so going by this chart, which you get with the homebrew kit from Cooper's, uh, the original gravity was 1039, which gave you roughly about 5.2% or potential alcohol level. And then the reading we just got now was 1005, which gives you uh, 0.6. So what you do is you minus the 0.6 off the 5.2, which gives you 4.6. And then after the secondary fermentation, which happens in the bottle, uh, it will go back to 5.1. So this is roughly about a 5.1% alcohol content. So before you bottle, you do have to sterilize and sanitize your bottles. Um, so I do use the Cooper's plastic um, and Bill has got some glass bottles here. Now I've got to say, when I did sanitize and sterilize these bottles, uh, I found that the glass were really clean and the plastic were not. So there's a bit of a throwback. Using plastic, they can get a bit more dirtier. You've got to be more thorough. With the glass, you probably can just use a sanitizer. The only problem when you're first starting the brew, when you're just learning, you could have a bad batch and using glass could be a problem because if you've not let it ferment properly uh, and it has a secondary fermentation and it, and it starts to ferment more in the bottle, it will create gases and it'll explode the bottle. So it's, it can be dangerous. 
So Coopers do recommend that you use the plastic bottles uh, when you start. Now, the good thing also using plastic, if you do drop them accidentally, it's not gonna make a mess. So with the glass bottles, we have the metal bottle caps and the capper. So this is actually Bill's, and he'll be showing us how to do that. But also with the plastic bottles, you'll find that if you keep using the plastic lids, they will lose their seal. Okay, so it is good to uh, change the lids uh, periodically. So usually I bottle this on my own, and so what I do is I pour the bottles out and then I'll come around and then put all the carbonated drops. But it is better to do the process faster. So I will be using Cooper's carbonated drops. Now when you're using a 750 bottle, a long neck, you do need to put two drops per bottle. So in this case here, I'm gonna get Ron to pass me the bottles. Uh, I'll use the little bottler and bottle the uh, brew into the bottles, and then I'll get Bill to put in the carbonated drops. So the reason we're using carbonated drops is basically as the word says, it's to carbonate the beer. So if you don't put enough, it won't be uh, throthy enough. And if you put too much, it can actually explode the bottle. Okay, so you will get a bit, bit of brew on the ground. So it's best to put a towel down before you start. Now, so we have sanitized our hands. I have touched a few things, so I'll sanitize again. But we have sanitized our hands. And so now we'll get into it. Turn the tap on. Okay, so what happens here, you just push the bottle up against the little bottler. It's got a little valve on the bottom, so when you push up, it allows all the brew to come through. Okay, so once it's full, you need to put the carbonated drops in straight away and cap it off. So Bill, I'll get you to show how to do that. Right, so you just pop two drops in, put it on the bottler, add the cap, and press down. Wow, that's so easy, isn't it? Easy. That's fantastic. All right, Bill, I'll keep passing these to you. Okay, I'm just gonna take this lid off a little bit just to give it a bit more air coming through. All right, so now that's all the glass bottles. Now we're gonna use the plastic. You can see what's going on with this one. Oh yeah. Okay, so you'll notice when you get to the bottom of the tap uh, that you won't be able to get any more of the beer out or the brew out. Um, so what I do use is some props and I just prop up the back end. So I'm just using cork boards in this case here. So this is where you do need a second person uh, to help you. Coopers make this fermenter tap a little bit higher than standard because they want the sediment to stay out of the bottle. Okay, so we're getting close to the end. Now, Bill's already closed and capped these ones off, uh, put the um, carbonated drops. So what he does, uh, he will do it really tight because these uh, plastic bottles are notorious for uh, losing air. And if you do lose air in these bottles, the beer will be useless. So you've got to close them nice and tight. So the sediment at this point hasn't been stirred, which is really good. When I do do this on my own, I do tend to stir it up a bit. This is perfect, it's only stirred minor. Okay, so this is the last bottle, we're done. Okay, so one year in the making, and uh, Ron's wish came true. Bill made the brew for us. It is now Thank complete. You. And uh, so Bill's IPA brew smells beautiful. I'm sure it's gonna taste great. So usually you drink beer around three weeks or after, um, but I find most of my brews taste better after around about two, three months. So this is the first time I've made brew from grain and it's been a big learning curve. Uh, Bill, it actually is quite easy to make. I'm, I'm fascinated how it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, and after we made the batch, uh, Bill shared something with me, which was quite interesting. He said that um, his wife and daughters get a little upset when he makes the brew. And so uh, it would have probably been better if he told me that before, uh, because my wife and girls were not happy with me. So uh, I made a promise I'll never do brew in the kitchen again. So stay tuned for the upgrade of the alfresco area, because I'll be making home brew outside with grain in the future, but that could be like a year off. But seriously speaking, I found um, it's great to make a boutique beer, but very labor intensive and also uh, a lot of time. So it's, uh, if you're time poor uh, and you wanna make brew, I definitely suggest to make it from a kit. Uh, I use Coopers, I think they're fantastic. They've got a large range of products and you can make a, a brew with Coopers in an hour. Um, this took us probably more like about eight hours. So if you're a brewing enthusiast, uh, this is the way to go, but make sure, now I understand why people brew outside, not inside. So people do it in their garages. And I do wanna mention there actually is a channel that I do follow, a fellow who makes brew, uh, and the channel is called Stoneyard Vineyard, and so I call him Mr. Stoneyard, 
Uh, he makes a lot of different brews. He's a bit of a larrikin, um, but if you look past that, he just is amazing. He makes a wide range of his own beers, also mead and also uh, wine. And he, this guy is just really good. A bit underrated, he doesn't have a high subscription, so I will put a link below for him uh, if you want to subscribe. I definitely recommend it. So a good habit to get into when you're making your brew is that you write down your details uh, on the box or wherever you're, you're storing it to make sure when you brewed it and also what type of brew you've made. So this one here is just called Bill's Home Brew IPA. So I do believe Bill's daughter made some labels and what was the label called? It's called Blue Mountains Hop Heaven IPA. Beautiful. If you're interested I will put the recipe below in the descriptions if you want to know how we made this brew. So I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Dee from Country Brewer who helped me to uh, prepare all this. Uh, so Dee has an incredible amount of knowledge and she has a stock full of different type of products, so many things, and she has so many of her own recipes. So I will put a link below for Country Brewer and for Dee for Country Brewer and Nepean. And as I said before, I will put a link below for the sanitizing process. It is detailed and you'll see comprehensively how I've done it. And I'll put a link once again for Coopers for their homebrew kit. And finally, I'd like to thank Dr. Penner for inspiring us to make this video. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. And I'd also like to thank William West for sharing his recipe and also helping us to make the brew. Great work, Moose and Ron. So if you are interested in this book that we spoke about, uh, Riddles of the Shroud, I will put a link below for Amazon. And also, Bill tells me that he made a video uh, and he's posted it on YouTube. And it's just to explain the book, is that correct? That's right. So that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. And I'd ask if you please drink responsibly. And if you have any comments, leave them below and I will get back to you. And I'd ask if you please consider to subscribe, hit the like button and share this video and there's many more to come. Thanks guys. No way you'll fail with this. This is way I've too basic. Failed. I've never had one fail. Not I have failed great. because great. on the Cooper's beers because I let them go too long because I was oh, trying to settle them. Actually, I, yeah. I lie. I did um, not so long ago. This is on um, camera. I left it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. We know the secret. It's good. We know the secret. <laughs> I've never had that problem before. That's because well, you were you using. Got, that's because you were using, using a Bosch. That's because you were using the right Obi. That's a very fast drill. Yes, it is. Only the best, Bosch. That's a lot of Bosch. <laughs> <laughs> so usually you drink beer around three weeks or after, um, but I find most of my brews taste better after around about two, three months. I like it after two, three days, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's got to be a blooper, though. Why wait three days? I <laughs>